Welcome to the Circle Jerk edition of the show. Uh, <laughs> so Michael Breslin, Patrick Foley, and Kat Rodriguez, thank you for joining me. To, to get started, can you explain to people what, not what A, but what your Circle Jerk is? So our Circle Jerk is a live stream um, theatrical event. It's not necessarily a play, but it's a live stream theatrical event featuring three performers, me, Patrick, and Kat, um, each playing three characters um, in a sort of gay, queer send-up tribute to Charles Ludlum's The Mystery of Irma Vep. And it's a three-act comedy about um, white gay men on an island not far from here. Um, it's a summer island, but it is January. And um, the owner of the house is canceled and devises a plot to seek his revenge. And I feel like that's- <laughs> That's so gorgeous. Description. <laughs> um, lots of costumes and more wigs than people, which is always good. 100%. I attended a FaceTime. Well, I was not FaceTime. You weren't a FaceTime. I attended a rehearsal the other day. And like, I was like, I, and I hope, you know, this is, I mean, this is a complete compliment, obviously, because I kind of think that's what you're going for. All the characters are so punchable. I wanted to like kick everyone in the ass. That's great. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> uh, sometimes I just walk around kicking myself in the ass. I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious because like the three of you, I mean, like even though like all of you like look really cool, but you're all, like super theater nerds. And like how do like cool people end up becoming like super theater nerds? Uh, I, I, we're, there's no coolness here, I don't think. <laughs> your, your answer is refuting our coolness. <laughs> no, yeah, it's only theater nerds. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's so weird. Like, so we have a new company that we started called Fake Friends. And this is our like first official production as that company. Um, but we've done with Ariel Seibert. So it's the three of us plus Ariel Seibert. And three of us, me, Kat and Ariel met as dramaturgy students at um, a vocational school in Connecticut. And Patrick uh, was an acting student. Um, so we don't like to always like say the yell thing because it's sort of like annoying. But we met in the, <laughs> we met in the dramaturgy department where, um, you know, we were nerds for sure, but I would say that we were like cool nerds. Um, and Patrick was sort of like a nerd in the acting department because he's incredibly, um, I don't know, intelligent and bright and critically minded. Yeah, and I, I would say in, in addition to having um, a varied interest in um, form and also in extending performance beyond re regional theater, if we're gonna talk theater, beyond theater itself, um, you know, uh, considering um, pop culture, the kind of media that we consume on our phones, on the big screen, on any kind of screen, um, whether whether it's curated um, under that guise or um, appears as if it has no touch to it, uh, I think we were we are all interested um, engaging uh, and and engaging those kinds of media and dissecting them and figuring out why we respond to them individually and as a culture, um, and so that meant that we were having conversations not only in the classroom and not only amongst each other that was you know what we were studying and what we were doing practically in terms of our training because it is a it is a vocational school in that we, you are in classes and you are you know doing quote unquote real world right collaborations at the same time uh, we were also folding in um, conversations that you know were not the stuff of the curriculum um, that was not the stuff of a syllabus. So I think that um, finding uh, people who are kin in that, who can speak, you know, multiple languages, right? Um, and who can affirm the validity <laughs> uh, of that, that respondence and of that critique 
um, and cultural engagement, I, I think was really exciting, really energizing. And then it, you know, it allowed our conversations to be um, extremely specific, I think, amongst us all. Yeah, but that's precisely what you mean. Like right now I'm listening to you talk and I'm like, this sounds so cool. It's like a thesis. And then like every time that I read something for Circle Jerk, I was like, this sounds like the, like the nerdiest like thing in the whole world. But then like I'm actually watching the rehearsal and it's like a really funny like American Pie-ish, like, you know, uh, rowdy kind of comedy. So I would love to hear you talk about that, about how you turn those ideas that are super like, I feel like I should be wearing like my monocle and like look like the Monopoly guy. But then like in practice, they're like comedies and they're funny. And they're like, how do you like marry that, you know, like super like intellectual like love for theater with making really entertaining work as well? I think like entertainment, uh, the entertainment factor is like the key thing that we're after. And, you know, in terms of like the gestation of our three pieces, like oftentimes it's, I think something that is maybe important to note is that our, the first play we all worked on together was a play called This American Wife, which is about the, it, it, it's about a lot of things, but it centers around a sort of dissection and estrangement of the Real Housewives franchise. And we started working on it because Michael and I were in rehearsals for a piece together and we found out that we were both uh, sort of accidental experts in this, in this topic. And it, so we started like batting ideas together and then we both realized, this was like the first day we met. And then we like both realized we had the same sort of like theatrical gods and icons. And so we were like, let's do a mashup of sort of like the Real Housewives and the Worcester group. And like, that should be fairly, fairly, I don't know, fun for us if for no one else. But because we started but because our first show was based on a topic that we were we had a truly encyclopedic knowledge in, uh, for the subsequent two shows, we've like based the the um, the generative process in a lot of research um, so that we can like meet ourselves at that same level. That said, we're all deeply stupid and have like <laughs> deeply slapstick. I mean, like Michael, <laughs> deeply like slapstick, sometimes pun oriented or like onomatopoetic kind of senses of humor. Um, and Michael, Michael has this like joke that like, there's like such a thing as like a Foley Rodriguez joke, which is where like Kat and I make a really like bad pun or like double entendre. And it starts okay. It starts okay. Okay. And then it. It starts okay. Like, like we could have, we could have walked away and like, we wouldn't have been humiliated, but instead we're like, no, no, like we need to get that laugh. <laughs> and so we like beat it. <laughs> that Patrick and I are really pushing again. No, I'm <laughs> enjoying, enjoying riffing on each other. I think that humor is so important. Comedy is so important. The ability to laugh um, is, is an essential part um, of critique and, and criticism. Um, and I think that, you know, sometimes when I, when I am invited to speak or I'm speaking on a subject and I'm talking about you know, isms and systems, et cetera. Um, I'm either misunderstood as wanting uh, a kind of popular culture or a kind of theater or kind of whatever art it is that is the Disney version, right? That is the ideal version. And then there, I think sometimes I'm misunderstood as wanting like doom and, you know, just like the, what I would refer to as pornographic, <laughs> you know, trauma porn, poverty porn, you know, like slapping people upside the heads. And I, I think that, um, that what we, what both of those things miss um, is, is a nuance, right? Um, and and what, what, is, what is human is the nuance, that it's much more complicated, that it's, it's much more, I think, productive and interesting and provoking to go after what is, what is gray, not necessarily, um, not to say that every single thing is gray, um, but I think it's so much more human to invest in the contradictions and to mine why they exist and where that tension comes from, because they often point at, you know, things that are much bigger, right, than the individual. Um, and that's not to say that we are, you know, many products, right, of our time. Absolutely not. We have agency within that. I think, though, that, you know, the comedy and you know, Jose, you, you finding that it that was kind of American pie, right? Like, um, we're absolutely influenced by that, I think, you know, culture, that's what we came up in. Um, and so, you know, part of it is putting ourselves under the microscope, right? Um, why, why is that funny to our sensibility? You know, what are we actually laughing at? Blah, 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 all that kinds of all that kinds of shit. 
<laughs> okay, I'm about to ask questions about quarantine, so I think we should do our first shot. Oh, if we're gonna yes. do more than one. Is this too small? Uh, no. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, okay, I'll do a little bit yeah, more. A little bit more. I mean, what, what's gonna happen when viewers find out it's, we record this at nine in the morning? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, I think this is too big, but whatever. You only live once. Cheers. <laughs> Ooh. Holy I shit. It wasn't good tequila. Oh. I started with Casamigos. <laughs> oh my God, Kat. <laughs> well, there was this much left in the box. Absolutely, <laughs> Casamigos. Yes. The, the guy at my liquor store, what's that? The guy at my liquor store convinced me to buy this like banana whiskey. It is like the strangest, most like, yeah, it's like so weird. Banana uh, is it good? Define good. Okay. No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's no. better than when I was, when I was like finally starting to drink and this is such a trash story, you know, I'm from New Orleans and I somehow did not participate in that aspect of the culture. I don't know. I, I don't know. I was- You're there. a good Catholic girl. That's what yeah, it is. <laughs> probably that. Um, <laughs> remember like when I became of age and I was like okay I'm gonna drink but I had obviously a trash taste because I hadn't drank anything before I was like I <laughs> looking on the internet I was like oh my god chocolate wine <laughs> <laughs> don't do it <laughs> <laughs> don't do it let me write that down yeah, I think I, I think I'm gonna pass anyway. But like, I was addicted. Do you remember those like vodkas that came like in a plastic bottles that were like cotton candy flavor and like marshmallow yeah, flavor? I loved all of them, all of them so much. Like, I wish they were still like a thing so I could mix them with my my what is it like cloth that cloth thing? Oh yeah, um, eBay is somewhere. Last white cloth. Yeah, can you imagine me eBaying like marshmallow vodka? No, I don't know, but maybe, maybe <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Um, so Michael, you teach theater also. And like, since we've established that all of you are like huge theater nerds, I wanna hear, cause all of you are very young and everything. So I wanna hear you talk thank a little you. bit about that, about, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> about, about uh, right now, it seems that we're like caught in this like limbo where like the old guard, so to speak. And I imagine like many of your professors and mentors in many ways have declared that theater doesn't exist right now, that it's on pause and that we're just waiting for the vaccine and then things are gonna go back to like normal. However, that's bullshit. Yeah. And the three of you <laughs> and the three of you are actually doing, you know, like Michael, like at the beginning, you, like, you didn't describe this as a play, but rather as an experience. So I would love to hear you talk about what is theater then now and like has your idea of what theater is changed during the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, that question has really been like the driving question for our work since This American Wife. Like one of the lines in Doll's House Part 3, um, which was an adaptation of Doll's House Part 2, but we didn't read or see <laughs> Doll's House Part 2. <laughs> sort of a conceptual joke. But one of the lines that one of the young characters said was like, in this house, theater is dead and content is queen, which is sort of like, it was a darkly ironic statement in that show, but we are really, we have been thinking about how this like content culture, this online multi-platform culture sort of like fits into a theatrical, you know, ensemble or, or working methodology. Um, so with this show, I mean, there's so much to say on this question. I think that theater, Patrick and I were on a call of two days ago or something and we were talking about like, you know, what is theater? And without getting too much into the like dramaturgy ivory tower, like this is what theater is. I would say that for this, this specific experience, we're super inspired by um, like YouTubers, like people who do like YouTube live or, um, there's this amazing YouTuber. I don't know if you know her. Her name is ContraPoints. And she makes these like, oh, oh we have to send you a link. She yeah. makes these like hour long, super queer, <clears throat> very flamboyant, um, Baroque sort of like YouTube philoso like philosophical essays, like essay videos. Um, and they're almost like John Waters and like a philosophy seminar at a college, like sort of mashed up. So we were super inspired by her work, and I find that work to be very theatrical. It's about costume, it's about display, it's about 
characters. She shifts characters a bunch in them. I think all these theatrical principles are absolutely present in our online life as it exists now. Um, and I think, uh, Jose, what you say about like the old guard and what some people might call like gatekeepers or, you know, whatever, um, we need to like really push against that and like think about ways that, you know, the internet is a way to make things more accessible, um, to allow other voices who have been historically shut out to like express their voices. And I think like we were saying the other day, like Z-Way's um, baited live streams that she does on her Instagram feel like super theatrical. And that's not like a unique opinion for someone like of our generation. Like most of people log in to see like the live encounter between her and her audience. So I don't know, what do you, any other thoughts on that? Well, I was, I was gonna um, tease out or ask you to tease out, Michael, something, since you started with the Doll's House part three quote about content is that I remember a conversation that we were having in which you said, you know, that was really, that piece, like when we were making it was, you know, YouTubers and YouTube gurus and, you know, tutorials and all of that was really like, you know, at its height. And since then, the idea of what is content has gotten a little bit more, you know, um, not complicated, but there's just a little bit more meat, I think, to this, to the, to the discussion. So given Jose's question, I wanted to ask you, you know, that was true of Doll's House Part 3. In what ways has, has the idea of like content shifted since then that is part of this conversation about theater? So thank you. That's actually a really good guiding question. This is what dramaturgs, you know, we just talk and we ask questions. Um, I think the, the, the really exciting part of this show, Circle Jerk, for us is like finding the equivalence of like theater and this like horrible fake news um, misinformation era that we live in. Um, this, con this idea that like content uh, can be manipulated, which I think is often like heavily associated with like theater of like, you know, it's not real, it's fake. Um, which is like the fake friends thing. But this idea of um, uh, fake news, viral videos, all being sort of like in this economy of clicks and of like, you know, in 2016, we might say like the alt-right, now it looks different. I mean, it's so rapidly evolving, like how these trolls online manipulate content to spread misinformation and propaganda. I mean, we've, the COVID, pandemic has shown us, you know, the pandemic video, I think is the best example of like the horrific virality of content and what damage it can do. So that's definitely like, as you said though, Jose, like the show is very um, madcap and like not, you know, it doesn't take that serious tone, but uh, we're definitely interested in those themes right now. We should have we should have done like a drinking game. Every time someone said content with your shot, we would be like on the floor <laughs> right now. Not too late to start. I mean, it's a concept. It's a concept that I am critical of. This idea of like everything is content, um, but at the same time, I think some you know content. This economy could be a way for theater makers to, you know, take the reality that we're living in and move forward rather than be like, oh, when are we going to go back? It's like. Well, I think the past few months, this is such a cliche thing now to say, but like the past few months have shown us like, do we really want to go back? Like, I think we need to think in different ways. Go back to what? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Can we go back? <laughs> yeah. I'm a sucker for a, for a pun. And I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you know this, because I don't think I ever wrote about it, but I saw this American wife at Next Door at New York Theater Workshop. Oh my God. And. Yeah. And I went because I love a pun and I was like, I love this American life because I'm secretly uh, an 80 year old white woman. Mm, same. <laughs> <laughs> but I have never in my life seen a single episode of any of the real house housewives shows. However, once I was there and you were like, so I remember like there were like screens and you were like lip syncing at times to what the characters were saying. And I have no idea who any of these women are. I've never seen them before. But I knew what they were talking about because like so many of the things that they say become part of the fabric of how we talk. Yes. And it's that thing where you know the show, even if you've never seen the show. So as young theater makers, have you found a resistance 
uh, when you're trying to do work that speaks to, because, you know, like, for so many reasons, the pop culture of each era, I think, is always seen as less than, as lesser, right? As like not good enough. Have you found a lot of resistance and people being like, how are you making a, a show about the real housewives and not about, I don't know, I can't even think of like wives that would be approved. You know, like, I don't know, like why are you making a show about like Karl Marx or something or like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We were, yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh, I, you were? <laughs> <laughs> I think This American Wife was interesting because it sort of landed us in a weird place that people, that we struggled to communicate to people before they had seen the show where um, people were like, why don't you just do it at Joe's Pub? And we were like, well, yes, but there is like an aesthetic sort of interrogation happening that we like also want to experience, not just like um, sound buffer sponge walls and like, you know, projector. Um, but I, I mean, I think it goes back to the question at the beginning, which is that like, we always want to like leave people thinking and then make them laugh and then make them think about why they laughed. And um, so playing with the um, expectations that people bring into the space um, is something that's really exciting for us. And so for example, with Circle Jerk, the, um, the ad campaign and the sort of like visual language that we're introducing to people, um, it's, it's very important to us to sort of like set them up for um, an experience that in some way we can either undercut or, uh, or exploit. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna have a shot because I wanna ask you something about circle tricks. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> um, but I would just say to that question too, Jose, like <clears throat> that question is so um, perceptive about our work, so thank you. And, and um, yes, we do receive a lot of like doubts and sort of like, um, skepticism about making work about these subjects and I uh, know that it like you know the four members of the company are all queer identifying in some way and this this relationship between the queer subject or queer person and like popular culture um, is a distinct relationship you know like gay men worshiping divas you know, one of our favorite, one of my favorite books is The Queen's Throat by Wayne Kustenbaum, like where he talks about gay men and their obsession with like opera divas. But this, you know, that's a trope and that's like a real thing. And um, I find it, it is frustrating sometimes to be like, yeah, we're doing a show about the Real Housewives and people are like, oh, I know what that is. I'm not gonna, you know. Well, it's so insidious. It's so, it's so insidious, you know, it's, I think it's both in the theater circle in terms of, you know, um, like producing or, or whatever, you know, that, um, and, but it's also in terms of, you know, the critical conversations around it, right, and how something is received or understood or how it is contextualized, and I mean that, you know, um, it's not only, of course, it is also present in the, the, the critics and the conversations that are had, you know, reviewing a show, um, and it's something I, I, I know that I encountered, that I know that Michael encountered, that Patrick, I know you encountered, that Ariel encountered also within graduate school, right? In terms mm -hmm. of how our writing or how our work was understood. Um, and it, and it can be extremely patronizing, <laughs> um, and to, to try to, you know, um, validate or legitimize, yes, please drink to that, um, validate or legitimize, um, so it, it feels like gaslighting, right? To hear, you know, oh, that's not whatever, or that's not it, when you know, you know, the, the culture that you are a part of, and you understand it because somebody else doesn't, or does and values it so little, it, it's, it's extremely frustrating, and also, um, it's exciting that, that it hasn't stopped us, right? That I think it's become a kind of, you know, gasoline or like, you know, really dry wood <laughs> for our fires um, that, that, that keeps us pushing forward. But I'm, glad it, that, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that, that you, that you're both talking about something that I'm like, that's like, so, um, wow, the whiskey is like hitting me. Um, yeah. No, I, you know, what you're talking about in terms of like the audiences that are also like you're reaching in so many ways the one audience that you probably can't reach right now because of what it looks like right now are critics and they're the ones who like re would refuse to like i mean i don't refuse to watch real housewives 
for some like moral or whatever like thing i just i'm just really worried because like i'm like i fear that if i like it too much i'm gonna end up like watching all of it and i don't i don't need more tv shows in my life yeah um <laughs> but I'm curious. I'm curious about that. You know, like as like as young theater makers, and this is not something that happens just only to you, but for most theater young theater makers, um, a lot of complaints that I hear from y- people who want to be critics who are BIPOC, and definitely like much, much, much younger. Even if they're white, they're much younger than the current critical establishment. They seem to be living again, like in this like parallel universe where pop culture doesn't exist where all we have is like O'Neill and Miller and like Brecht and that's it. And that's the world that we live in. And, you know, music doesn't exist. Rihanna doesn't exist. Real Housewives don't exist. And like, it's so sad because like right now should be the moment when in many ways your work is criticism also. And it's like this beautifully done like theatrical essay in a way. Uh, It's pop culture commentary. So how do you how do you help me or how do I help you get to critics? Like, do we just like vanquish the existing ones and wait for new ones to arrive? Or how do we get them to open their minds? Because like, they don't want to open their minds. I mean, do we need to? I mean, do we need to get them to open their minds? When we did This American Wife at the Yale Cabaret, uh, we got like a really snarky review from like a New Haven newspaper source. And we like incorporated it into the show the next day. (laughs) And um, that kind of like, and all of our pieces are built to be flexible in that way and to be meta theatrical in that way and to engage with uh, people ignoring us or criticizing us or celebrating us um, in that way. Uh, Yeah, I think think that as, I think that, you know, the critics are going to um, deal the blow to themselves if they uh, don't keep up with the direction that the culture is moving in. And, and well, they'll become less relevant. So it sort of won't matter. Yeah, I'll drink to that. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask, because, you know, like, uh, I want to be very respectful of your time. I, I did have a question about Circle Jerks, because I, when I first saw the name of the show, I was like, I love the name of the show so much, because when I was in high school, I was the gay one, right? Clearly. However, I was the only one who didn't go to the Circle Jerks, because I thought they were so gross. <laughs> <laughs> so, all my like straight classmates would have circle jerks and they would invite me and I'm like, and you say I'm gay? <laughs> oh, I wonder if you have any memorable like high school, like college era, like circle jerk experiences or non experiences that you want to share. Well, in middle school, I feel like every sleepover was a circle jerk. <laughs> Wait, Wait, you guys know this. We've talked about this. No, but like not a literal one. Uh, okay, so we were in circles jerking, but we were not jerking each other. Right? No, that was way more literal than I thought. <laughs> it was, like, this is, see, this is the thing. They're the smart ones. They're the sort of, like, metaphorical ones, and I'm the one, like, being like, we need a fart joke here. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, we weren't touching each other's Ds. Like, we were yeah. Like, oh. I live in the literal. <laughs> I, you know, I have to say, I'm more like you. Well, actually, I'm, yeah, like, I was unaware of any homoerotic activity going on, like in any anywhere I was. I was mostly just friends with the girls, so they weren't like different you know, kind of homoerotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> M- more based on you know processing. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so I never knew about them until I discovered porn. Until <laughs> like it wasn't a concept in my mind. Or actually, I think it was actually the Spring Awakening production, the original production of Spring Awakening. Mm. Where I was like, what is that? Hanchen or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like even gayer than like a traditional circle trick. You learn yeah. about it from a musical. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you put it that way, yes. Wait, Kat, what about you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know that I have any not defined as like people sitting in a circle. Um, I guess the the closest thing that I was, I didn't know of any of these concepts about that. That I would have to that is that when I was, when I was in elementary school, I had a really good friend 
um, who would who would come over, and we were like we were really young. It would put us maybe at like eleven or twelve like best friends kind of thing. And then, um, I, you know, just like we enjoyed giving each other massages. Um, and then another girl, her best friend came to my home um, and we were inviting her into our massage practice. And um, I offered my body as tribute um, <laughs> that I was gonna get this great massage and then I was gonna give a massage and then give another <laughs> massage. And they, put like shaving cream they put a whole bunch of like gross stuff on me um and I like yeah I think that that was actually a really (laughs) experience um yeah so I that's the closest thing that I have and it didn't end well for me because something that was really beautiful you know um got turned into something I think that was that was really mean and I it is no you know surprise that it was amongst girls and it's it's no surprise that it was also you know like femme on femme I think interaction and it got it got shut down by a by another girl who came in was like what the I I can only assume was like what the fuck was that you know what is this and then my friend was like oh right yeah (laughs) yeah I did not expect that yeah, I did not expect that. I know, either. nobody said, I know. <laughs> well, th- that's our musical. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah, that's like, that's like, that's like almost like a scene caught from like American Beauty or something like that. Yeah. yeah something like that. So, so make, it, like, make, make it a musical. It wasn't allowed to become a circle jerk. <laughs> oh, that's very, very sad. Uh, the last thing I want to ask you right now, wow, that risk is strong, is um, how, you know, right now that we, we're all in different places. Like I'm assuming that you can't gather. It was like, so it was heartbreaking, but it was also very exciting to see the rehearsal and people wearing masks. I'm like, uh, people are wearing masks because there's a pandemic, but also like people are wearing masks and doing shows. Um, so what are some things that you have uh, maybe discovered about working remotely and working digitally and not being able to see each other as often that are things that are actually pretty cool that you want to borrow and continue if, you're ever allowed to see other people again. So one thing that we have done, again, like from the first show, but actually wound up being a great tool for this show is that we are Google Doc, like oriented for the script. Um, So the script is like, for this show, we do have a very legitimate script, but for the past two shows, they were more like- Suggestions. Performance (laughs) scores. but that, you know, they're accessible by everyone, like the designers, the writers, the directors, you know, the dramaturgs, whoever's working on it. So we can update it in real time and everyone has access to the living document, which is sort of amazing. And in COVID, it was just another tool that was really great. And then we did our paper tech and a lot of our design meetings and a lot of our creative, you know, development meetings like over Zoom. And honestly, not having like the commute or the, the you know, cause like we worked, we developed this at Ars Nova and we all live in Brooklyn and that's like an hour commute both ways to like get there. And sometimes we would just need to go to have like a single meeting about like, when are the cues gonna land? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that I feel is a cool um, skill. We're also, I mean, we're also very good friends. So in in a certain way, not having the danger of um, the bar next door has been like really good in sort of like promoting productivity. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I think our process has always been really um, digitally inclined. Um, and the kind of, you know, conversations I think that used to happen um, that I miss, honestly, you know, after a rehearsal or after a show or like, you know, oh, we're, we just so happen to be in the same area, you know, let's, let's meet up. Those kinds of things are awesome and nice and, and uh, also very influential on the work, you know, those Mm -hmm. conversations are really important, have now moved to, you know, text conversations. And I think that um, there is the opportunity to be um, more intentional um, at the same time uh, in, in terms of like, you know, reaching out to, to somebody and, and reaching out as a friend versus like reaching out as like, okay, now we're going to talk work. 
right? Um, before, I think because, you know, it would be like after, after we did something that was the show or like, you know, we're meeting, it's just, uh, it's not, not conflation is a bad thing, but now it's like more intentional, like scheduling meetings for all of us to get together mm -hmm. to like, talk for an hour, um, for example. Um, but it's also, I think, you know, just to acknowledge the, the flip side of it with pandemic is that I, I recognize like I'm way more inclined now to unplug. I was way more plugged in before the pandemic. And one of the ways in which, you know, just like Zoom burnout um, and also just like loneliness, um, you know, it, it means that also technology, it can be hard to take that that step um, versus like I have my ass has to be at rehearsal and so therefore I'm available. Um, so it's always been a part of our process and it is really good now that we can be intentional. And also I think that there, you know, sometimes it, that it is a little hard because we miss each other. You know, I miss, I miss seeing everybody in 3D. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that I brought the bar to yeah. you. Thank you. Yes. Um, before I ask you to invite people to, I love your glass. It looks like a lighter. Uh, this, I think it's supposed to be like a lipstick thing or I actually oh. don't know. It's my roommates. <laughs> I wanted to ask you something, Patrick, because yeah. I think it's you. One of your avatars on social media is that kid from Satyricon, right? Exactly, yeah. That's the creepiest, but also like the coolest thing I've ever seen. Well, the movie, it's so funny. So <laughs> this is an example of how I am maybe stu I'm stupid, but people think I'm smart. I had not seen that movie when I made that my icon. I just was, I, I saw the picture and I loved it and I thought it looked like kind of like me as a kid. So I put it up there. A flash forward to like a month and a half ago, um, we're in costume talks for, there's a character in Circle Jerk called the Troll, um, who's kind of like a Dionysian chaos merchant who's immortal. Um, and he serves as a kind of narrator slash instigator uh, in Circle Jerk that I play. And so we were talking about the costumes and our, our, per, our costume designer Cole was like, oh, so like Satyricon. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, you know, your, your Instagram picture, Satyricon. And I like went home and I watched it and I was like, this is exactly what this play is. <laughs> it's like violent gay people in ancient Greece. Like this is the play. <laughs> Uh, Maybe yeah. you're a prophet then. On a deeply visceral level that not even you understood at the time. <laughs> and that's the thing, like there's a spiritual presence in my artistry that um, doesn't align with what's happening up here. <laughs> I love that. So would you like to invite our viewers and our listeners to check out Circle Jerk and uh, what the dates and how they can find it. And if you have any other works that are streaming or available to purchase or whatever, plug everything right now. Woo! Okay. Um, <laughs> um, come to the Circle Jerk live October 18th through 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're hoping to get global audiences. Global. Um, you can find uh, ticket information, which go goes from $5 to $50, if you're feeling like you want to support artists in this time. Um, at <laughs> at circlejerk.live is the website and all the information is there. You'll purchase your ticket and then you'll receive a password to the Vimeo link. It's at 7.30 p.m. but I think maybe the- um, The 22nd. 22nd. Yeah. Day the presidential debate is happening, um, <laughs> happening uh, <laughs> is at 7 p.m. instead of 7.30, but that's not fully announced yet. So I don't think that we should Oh yeah, it might have it, it might not. Yeah, we don't know. Got it. All of the words in presidential debate happening are in scare quotes. Every <laughs> exactly. <time. laughs> but that's an amazing double feature. Circle jerk followed by the jerk that happens in a circle. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I was under the miss, uh, miss something. I thought that you were gonna like do like a show and then like the rest of the dates were gonna be like the recorded version and you're gonna be doing it live every night. We're doing it live every night at 7.30, six performances, all three of us in the space, 13 cameras, switching between 13 cameras, four different sets. It's gonna be a spooktacular, um, yeah. And then it'll be available on demand for like two or three weeks after those six live performances. Wow, so y'all are crazy. Like, do people get like a special, like if they punch like a car with like, if they punch like, if they attend every performance? I love that. <laughs> 
I mean, the performances will all be different. So, you know, who knows what goes, what's going to happen. <laughs> in, in of itself. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me and break a leg and have fun at your circle trick. And I'll see you there. <laughs> thank you so much for having us. Love you. Thank you. Of course.